Hello everyone. Thank you so much for attending my lecture recital. Today I will be discussing Ambroise Thomas' 1868 Hamlet, and particularly his Ophelia, known as Ophelie, and her mad scene. As you will soon see, Ophelie's mad scene is derived from operatic expectations and tropes of the time, as well as 19th century views on hysteria, women's mental illness, and beliefs regarding the ideal woman. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the live chat and I will endeavor to answer them. I'd like to say a huge thank you to my collaborative pianist, Mandy madrid Sikic, First Presbyterian Church of Santa Barbara, my doctoral committee, the chair, Professor Benjamin Brecker, Dr. Isabel Barakdarian, and my academic advisor, Dr. Martha Sprigg. I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Linda Di Fiore, my voice teacher, Dr. John Bellarino, my coach, Adrian Cleary, Dr. Anthony Garcia and Connor Long, Dr. Kira Folk Farber, and Carly Yartz, my academic advisor. Thank you so much to my parents, Drs. David and Michelle Merrer, and my brother, Gary Merrer, my fiance, Wyatt Whitson, Dr. Molly Clements, Dr. Tyler Reese, and Christina Esser for helping me with editing my document and lecture. Thank you also to Martha Spriggs, dissertation seminar class who always brought new perspectives to my writing and research and who were very supportive of me and everyone else in class. Jen, Jillian, Chloe, Sunaina, Mark, Kevin, Liza, and Lauren. And finally, thank you so much to my friends and family who are attending today. During my first year of grad school, I performed Jake Heggie's Songs and Sonnets to Ophelia, which is when I became curious about Ophelia's mental state and the history behind Mad Scenes. When I came across Ambroise Thomas' 1868 Mad Scene and saw how different it was from Heggie's, then looked at the Shakespeare and saw how different both of these pieces were from the original, I decided I wanted to study the history behind different versions of Ophelia's madness. I hypothesized that each of these scenes were related to views on hysteria during their eras. This is where my research began. To show you the roots of my curiosity, Mandy and I will perform three of the four Heggie pieces throughout this lecture recital. Here is our version of the first song, which shows a late 20th century portrayal of the role. <laughs> 
of this research was to study the historical influences on Thomas' operatic mad scene. First, I will discuss the main genres from which Thomas borrowed to compose Ophélie's mad scene, bel canto, and French grand opera. Second, I will give a brief explanation on the history of hysteria, especially focusing on the 19th century. I will then explain how Thomas, Barbier, and Carré used these cr to create the archetypal 19th century Ophélie, who was based on, but different from, Shakespeare's Ophelia. From this historical information, I will explain my own analysis of the music and text, using my knowledge of the historical context, to find evidence of symptoms based in these 19th century beliefs. In other words, based on this history, how can we as 21st century performers, directors, teachers, and coaches humanize this character? Because Ambroise Thomas changed Shakespeare's character to better fit his audience's understanding and expectations, I argue that we as singing actors, directors of opera, voice teachers, and vocal coaches must update this character to better fit the understanding of a 21st century audience. Toward the end of my presentation, I explained my analysis of the music and text and how I used my knowledge of the history behind the role to find evidence of symptoms better suited to a 21st century diagnosis. According to scholar Stephen Willier, a mad scene is a scene in which a character, usually a heroine, portrays a mental collapse on stage. Some of the most famous examples include those of the title roles of Donizetti's 1835 Lucia di Lammermoor, Donizetti's 1830 Anna Bolena, Elvira in Bellini's 1835 I Puritani, as well as the French examples of Meyerbeer's Guinora in his 1859 Le Pardon de Pleurmel, and of course, Thomas Ophélie in his 1868 Hamlet. Thomas was highly influenced by Italian operatic style, especially bel canto. He began his career at the Opéra Comique, where he wrote several very successful operas, including the famous Mignon from 1866. He was well known for the characters he created through his music and for his innovation in opera, especially his orchestrations. In addition to Hamlet, Thomas references Shakespeare's plays in several of his operas, including Mignon, where he used A Midsummer Night's Dream as the play Philine and her acting troupe put on. He used exoticism in his operas, especially surrounding leading female characters. He included exoticism in Mignon, where he used stereotypical Romani music to represent the title role as a wandering orphan. As we will see later, he also uses this technique in Hamlet. As mentioned earlier, Thomas was influenced by the bel canto style in many of his operas. For example, Philine's aria in Mignon, Je suis Titania, is written for a high coloratura soprano and features intricate and difficult melismatic passages as well as a high tessitura. Unlike some 19th century composers who wrote their music to be remembered, Thomas composed for his present audiences. As a result, he changed his operas to please singers and audiences. Mignon, for example, was revised several times, including once to better fit the title role for Christine Nelson, the soprano who premiered Ophélie. He also changed the ending of the opera when he received poor reviews. Similarly, he changed Hamlet's ending from a happy one to a more traditional Shakespearean tragic ending when it was supposed to play at Covent Garden in London. In Hamlet, he heavily emulated aspects of French grand opera, especially from Meyerbeer. Hamlet's libretto was written by Michel Carré and Jules Barbier. This dynamic duo also wrote several other famous opera librettos around this time, including Gounod's Romeo et Juliette. Thomas wrote Hamlet as his first attempt at grand opera for his debut at the Opéra de Paris, or the Paris Opera. Because he wanted to create a roaring success as he had at the Opéra Comique, he chose Shakespeare's Hamlet as his subject, a very popular play in Paris at the time. Thomas' Hamlet and the role of Ophelie were based on Shakespeare's Hamlet and Ophelia, but also included several changes from the original Shakespearean play. Ophelie was composed for a virtuosic coloratura role within the bel canto convention. It was written for the rising Swedish soprano Christine Nilsson, and Ophelie was Nilsson's Opéra de Paris debut. She triumphed in Ophelie, both at the Opéra and at her Covent Garden performances. In her mad scene, she wore a white dress and had loose, messy hair with vines and flowers strewn through it. Her loose hair represented a lack of decorum or a departure from society, and thus represented madness 
in the Renaissance period and beyond. The use of flowers in her hair represents her virginity and her deflowering. Thomas, Barthier, and Carré also made alterations to Ophélie from Shakespeare's original Ophelia to give her more stage time, as was expected by opera audiences because prima donnas were very important during this time, and to give Ophélie an extremely virtuosic mad scene and on-stage suicide scene, which comprised most of Act Four. Ophélie's mad scene is quite different from that of Shakespeare's Ophelia. In the play, Ophelia sings five songs, including ballads, funeral dirges, and a couple of body songs. In the fourth song, Ophelia gives her flowers to other characters on stage, symbolic deflowering of herself or losing her virginity. However, in the operatic version, there are three main parts, an accompanied recitative arioso, a waltz, and a ballad with a coda. In the waltz, she gives away her flowers, wild rosemary and periwinkle. The first, Rosemary, is found in the Shakespeare. In it, Ophelia says Rosemary represents remembrance. On the other hand, the second flower, Periwinkle, is not from the original Shakespearean text. Thus, Ophelia's deflowering remains in her operatic mad scene. In giving away their flowers, Ophelia and Ophelie deflower themselves. The use of the ballad, or ballade in French, harkens back to the Shakespearean Ophelia's ballad. During the early 1800s, there was a rise in the popularity of madness on stage and in life, especially during the bel canto period. Madness was seen as a form of entertainment during the 19th century. People visited asylums, such as the public women's asylum in Paris, the Salpetriere, and Bedlam in England, for fun. Additionally, in 1827, there was a famous production of Hamlet in Paris, starring Harriet Smithson, who blew Paris away with her depiction of the mad scene. This led to an Ophelia craze in Paris in the 1820s and 30s, even leading to the creation of Ophelia-like fashion trends. This obsession with madness meant madness sold tickets. Thus, this Ophelia craze helped influence Thomas to take on Hamlet because he knew it would be an irreproachable subject. Bel Canto mad scenes were written for female characters. The pattern of etiology, or the cause of a disease, of mad scenes was a father prevents a young woman from choosing her own husband. The woman thinks her lover is dead, lost, or unfaithful to her. Thus, the woman becomes mad, hysterical, or unhinged. We see most of this pattern in Ophélie. Hamlet rejects Ophélie after he discovers her father was part of a plot to assassinate the old king Hamlet, his father. Ophélie thinks Hamlet is lost to her forever and will never love her again. Ophélie be then becomes mad, hysterical, and unhinged. During the bel canto period, mad scenes were usually written for coloratura soprano. They included intense melismatic and coloratura passages, high tessituras, meaning the median or average of the pitches, and were usually accompanied by an obbligato in wind instrument, often the flute or English horn. These instruments represented the mind separated from the body, but also can be a form of aural hallucination. Bel canto composers often used extended vocalises or phrases without text during their mad scenes. This, in combination with the melismatic passages and high tessitura, represented an inability to speak, forcing emotion out in incomprehensible screams. Mad scenes were also usually observed on stage by often male viewers. Thus, this gave women, mad women, both on stage and off stage audiences, creating a voyeuristic viewing of the mad scene, similar to the viewers at Asylum. Like other bel canto heroines, Ophelie was written for a coloratura soprano. Thomas also used extensive melismatic passages and vocalises and an extremely high tessitura. While he doesn't include an obbligato instrument per se, the flute, oboe, clarinet, and first violins represent aural hallucinations as well as separation of mind and body. Finally, as in Lucia's and other mad scenes, the chorus observes and comments on her mad scene while she is singing. Grand Opera took place at the Opéra de Paris, which was one of several rival theaters in Paris. Unlike its biggest competitor, the Opéra Comique, the Opéra required of its grand operas, large-scale productions, four- to five-act operas, elaborate sets, choruses, and costumes. Additionally, grand operas required large, important, and often serious subject matters. They also had ballet divertissements, 
often acting as interludes or entractes. Additionally, to distinguish grand operas from opéra comique, grand operas used recitatives in lieu of dialogues. Giacomo Meyerbeer and Eugène Scribe were the best known composer and librettist, respectively, of grand opera. To better fit the drama expected on the stage of the opéra, Scribe changed stories and even history. Meyerbeer was influenced by bel canto style, including Bellini, especially Norma, and Rossini, who himself composed productions for the opéra. One of the most important traits of grand opera that Thomas used in his Hamlet was the ballade, or ballad in English. In his grand operas such as Robert le Diable and La Fricaine, Meyerbeer used ballades to foreshadow what would come to pass later in the opera. Characters on stage did not know that the ballad foreshadowed their fate. Nineteenth-century audiences, however, knew that what was sung in the ballad would come to pass later. Ballads usually had multiple layers of meaning, what the character actually sings, the story slash ballad itself, what it foreshadows, and more. Thomas uses the ballad similarly in Ophélie's Mad Scene. Thomas uses one more very important musical trope of French opera in his Hamlet, exoticism. According to Ralph Locke, Musical exoticism is the process of evoking, in or through music, whether that music is exotic sounding or not, a place, people, or social milieu that is not entirely imaginary and that differs profoundly from the home country or culture in attitudes, customs, and morals. More precisely, it is the process of evoking a place, people, social milieu that is perceived as different from home by the people who created the exoticist cultural product and by the people who receive it. A major part of exoticism in music is othering, making a character seem different from one's own group, creating an us versus a them. It's often used in 19th century opera. Meyerbeer used exoticism many times in his works, including La Fricaine, where the title character is from either, depending on the version, India or Madagascar, and not from Africa. Exoticism is often used by European colonists, hence why it's so popular in 19th century France, to portray people of color and often women of color. Often, the exotic figure was a woman who was desired by, usually white, men. Many of these women, such as Vizet's Carmen and Puccini's Chocho San, are overtly sexualized, both in their portrayal and through their music, to make them seem more desirable. Exoticized women usually end up dying at the end of the opera, either by suicide caused by or murdered by a man in their lives. While Ophélie is a Danish woman, Thomas utilizes similar exotic styled musical techniques to other her during her mad scene, specifically in the ballade. Additionally, in othering and exoticizing Ophélie, Thomas connects her mental illness, hysteria, with her sexuality. To summarize, Thomas emulated French grand opera several ways, including by using a serious and important subject of Hamlet, creating an opera in five acts, using recitatives and not dialogues, making a large scale production, utilizing enormous sets, including huge choruses and ensemble numbers, as well as a ballet divertissement in act four before Ophélie's mad scene and a shorter ballet between her mad and suicide scenes. Thomas, Barbier, and Carré changed the story of Hamlet from the original Shakespeare to better fit the expectations of the grand opera audience. He used exoticism to other Ophélie in her mad scene in the faux, stereotypically Romani style. Additionally, he followed Meyerbeer's ballad trope in Ophélie's mad scene. Ophélie sings about the wili, or spirits of women who died before they were married, who lure men to dance themselves to death. She then drowns herself in her suicide scene. Like Meyerbeer's, there are several layers of meaning to Ophélie's ballade. The first and most obvious is the story Ophélie sings about the wili. The second is foreshadowing Ophélie's death by drowning. The third is the Shakespearean use of the ballad. And the fourth is the connection between the sung ballad and her mental illness. Overall, Thomas was a people pleaser. His goal was creating something that his contemporary audience would appreciate and which would fulfill their expectations.
We now move on to the second part of this study, a brief review of the history of hysteria, especially in the 19th century. As Ilsa Bates says, it must be apparent from this brief chronological review of hysteria that the manifestations of this disease tended to change from era to era quite as much as did the beliefs as to the etiology and the method of treatment. The symptoms, it seems, were conditioned by social expectancy, tastes, mores, and religion, and were further shaped by the state of medicine in general and the knowledge of the public about medical matters. The more detailed such knowledge became, the greater was the variety of symptoms. Furthermore, throughout history, the symptoms were modified by the prevailing concept of the feminine ideal. The first documentations of a hysteria-like illness, but by a different name, were discovered in documents from ancient Egypt from more than 4,000 years ago. However, the term hysteria comes from the ancient Greeks. In Greek, hystera means uterus. Thus, from the very beginning, we can see a connection between hysteria and femininity, especially feminine sexuality. Physicians in these ancient societies believed that the uterus moved and called it the wandering womb. They believed that if a woman were abstinent for too long, her uterus would desiccate and then would move to other parts of the body seeking moisture. Depending on what organ it landed near, the woman's symptoms would be different. Hysteria as a disease existed through the 20th century in European and American societies. For this case study, I will focus on 19th century beliefs on hysteria. Hysteria was used to define femininity and womanhood in the 19th century. While physicians believed it was related to women's sexuality, sex and the sexual organs were no longer the main cause. Instead, there was a move toward neurological and psychological etiologies including repressed emotions such as lust, love, and jealousy. However, some alienists, the term for 19th century psychiatrists, still used an updated version of the ancient uterine theory. Hysteria was still mostly viewed, therefore, as a female disease. Women were more vulnerable because they were required to repress their sexual needs and were considered more sensitive. Hence, they were susceptible to these repressed emotions and were more likely to get hysteria than men, according to 19th century alienists. Because of the interest in hysteria and women's mental illness, there was an influx of Ophelia obsession in visual and performance art. Both medical and fictional literature include hysteria. According to French historian Yannick Rippa, the 19th century French ideal woman was generous, self-effacing, tidy, clean, submissive, charitable, devoted, modest, and mentally and physically fragile. As seen from this list, there was a very narrow margin for what was deemed normal, and thus a very broad spectrum of what was considered madness. This caused a massive rise in the number of women admitted to asylums in France during this period. Think about the term alienists, which comes from the word alien, meaning that the person is foreign. Hysteria was also characterized in terms of its opposite, what was then deemed normal. This created an us, neurotypical versus them, mentally ill mentality. As a result, mentally ill people were viewed as other, as outcasts, and were treated as such. Does this seem familiar? Think back to exoticism and othering, and remember that Ophélie was musically othered during her mad scene. The othering could lead to feelings of isolation in those suffering with mental illness. This isolation, and especially connecting to characters of the past, is seen in the second song of Heggie's cycle, Women Have Loved Before. Here is a demonstration of that piece. 
on this slide is a famous depiction of Philippe Pinel, the head alienist of the public French asylum for women in Paris, the Salpêtrière. Here, we see Pinel freeing the inmates of the Salpêtrière from their literal chains in 1795. Most importantly is how the female patients are portrayed. They are scantily dressed, if you look closely, the one towards the back is bare-breasted, and the woman in the forefront is in a sexually suggestive pose. Note the men gazing at her and the other inmates, which is quite similar to Bel Canto and Ophélie's mad scenes. This portrays the connection between women's sexuality and their mental illness and the voyeurism surrounding these depictions. One common trope of female asylum inmates was the unmarried woman, also known as the spinster. Spinsters made up up to 50% of women in the Salpetriere in 1841. This again shows the relationship between mental illness and sexuality in women. Many of these women were said to have made up fantasy husbands or that they attacked younger relatives who were getting married as part of their psychoses. Additionally, women were cons only considered people in relation to the men of their lives. Neither the church nor family members would help unmarried women financially unless they became nuns. And because they were not allowed to enter the workforce, they had no access to income. If they didn't marry, they became non-entities. Women were told that if they didn't marry young, their uteruses would dry up, which comes all the way from the ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian ideas. Thus, getting married was a race against the clock. As a result, spinsterhood was a trauma for women who wanted to marry. They lost their identities and never were viewed as adult women if they never married. Mental illness and psychosis were some women's only escape from their trauma and oppression. Barbier, Carré, and Thomas included this asylum trope as part of their mad scene for Ophélie. Because Hamlet rejected her, she turned to psychosis rather than face the harsh realities of losing her identity. In summary, during the 19th century, Anything outside of patriarchal expectations of ideal women could be considered madness. Patriarchal expectations of women were very specific, leading to a very high rate of women being forced into asylums. It also created an us versus them or an othering in terms of mental illness. Othering mental illness leads to Thomas exoticizing and othering Ophélie in her mad scene, especially tying her mental illness, her hysteria, to what 19th century physicians and audiences believed to be its source, her sexuality. Ophélie turns to madness after Hamlet rejects her. Hamlet was Ophélie's only suitor. She realizes she will be shunned by society if she becomes a spinster, and she knows madness and death are better than becoming a non-entity. Act four of Hamlet has four different sections, an entracte ballet divertissement followed by Ophélie's mad scene, then a shorter ballet divertissement, which was probably used to allow for a set change before Ophélie's suicide scene. There are three parts to Ophélie's mad scene, an accompanied recitative arioso section, a waltz, and then a ballade, which ends with a very difficult coda. Hysteria in all its forms and derivations no longer exist in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, also known as the DSM-5 meaning the American Psychiatric Association doesn't deem this a real illness anymore. The hysterical operatic madwoman is outdated. After studying the score and searching for evidence of symptoms within the context of the text and music, I chose to create my own diagnosis for Ophélie so that I could better understand her character and give her a more believable character arc. I decided upon brief psychotic disorder, which is like schizophrenia but lasts between one day and one month where schizophrenia must last at least six months. Brief psychotic disorder must have at least one of the following symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and catatonic or grossly disorganized behavior. I would like to point out that I am not a psychiatrist or psychologist, and this diagnosis is a way for me to develop my version of the character. It is in no way scientific, nor is it meant to be definitive. For the duration of Act 4, approximately one day, Ophélie has three of these symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized or disordered speech. Ophélie's rejection by Hamlet is a psychological trauma because he is her only suitor. Without marriage, Ophélie loses her identity, her part in society, as well as loss of financial and social stability.
here is where we will start digging into the symptoms Barbier, Carré, and Thomas put into Ophélie's text and music. The first is textual. According to Yannick Rippa, unmarried women or spinsters in the 19th century Salpêtrière commonly made up fantasy husbands or imaginary husbands. Below, we can see in Ophélie's text that she has in fact made Hamlet her fantasy husband despite his rejection of her in the previous act. The text says, Hamlet is my husband and I am Ophélie. A sweet vow binds us. He gave me his heart in exchange for mine. And if someone tells you that he left me and forgot me, never believe them. In this case, a fantasy husband is also a delusion, which also fits in with Ophélie's 21st century symptoms as well. These next few symptoms are mostly musical in nature. Thomas included lengthy bouts of coloratura, long, extensive phrases, and a very high tessitura to show excessive emotionality and femininity. Next, Thomas instructs the singing actor where to laugh or cry, sometimes in very close proximity to each other. These spells of laughter and weeping occur in the cadenza during the accompanied recitative arioso section, in the cadenza of the ballad section, and throughout the coda. For the most part, Ascending and repeated fioratura represents laughing, while descending, especially chromatic coloratura, represents weeping. Finally, Thomas breaks the musical form of the accompanied recitative arioso section to show mental instability, as seen in the figure on the text Plané dans l'air, meaning was soaring in the air. Thomas begins a phrase as recitative and ends it as a cadenza. The next form of musical symptom is Thomas's use of exoticism in Ophélie's music. Thomas includes several exoticist musical clues. The first is his use of diegetic music in Ophélie's ballade. Diegetic music means the music is sung as part of the plot of the opera. To show that the music is diegetic, Ophélie first announces in her recitative that she will be singing, et maintenant, écoutez ma chanson, and now, listen to my song. Then she begins singing the song, a ballad based on Christine Nilsson's favorite Scandinavian folk tune. The use of a folk song emphasizes the simplicity of the song, showing that it is, in fact, diegetic, but also further exoticizing Ophélie. French composers such as Bizet used simpler melodies to depict their Romani characters, to make them seem different or other from their European counterparts, who sang in the French musical language of Romanticism. In the B sections of the ballad, Thomas also used vocalises, open fifths, two exotic instruments, the tambourine and the triangle, and dance-like rhythmic structures in Ophélie's melody. All of these tactics are used in exoticizing women of color in other operas, especially Romani such as Carmen. In particular, the music and dance parts were used to overtly sexualize these women of color. In using similar tactics in Ophélie's music, Thomas connects Ophélie's mental illness with her sexuality. I believe the use of this sensuality, exoticism, and possibly violent nature dehumanizes and others Ophélie, which works against what I believe we need to portray women as in the opera world. As a result, I will not include these traits in my interpretation unless at the behest of a director. In these figures taken from the vocal and orchestral scores of the B section of the ballad, we can see several examples of how Thomas used exoticized music in Ophélie's mad scene. For example, in the first line, which is Ophélie's line, we see the vocalise is sung on la, the lack of a third, except for escape tones, and the strong dance rhythms. In the orchestral part of the piano, we see the rhythmic open fifths, again avoiding the third and therefore the modality of the section. Finally, in the last line, in the excerpt taken from the orchestral score, we see the use of the triangle and tambourine, exotic sounding instruments which are associated with stereotyped Romani music. Next, I will discuss some musical elements that I believed translated into 21st century symptoms. The first is Thomas's use of tonal ambiguity and instability, which represents Ophélie's mental instability and fogginess. The second and third symptoms are from the libretto, including textual delusions and hallucinations. The most obvious delusions are the fantasy husband and the willi. The hallucinations are aural in nature. Then there are also orchestral aural hallucinations, which usually take the form of call and response between the orchestra, usually call, and Ophélie, usually response. Finally, 
there is evidence of textual disorganized speech, which comes in a couple of forms, most importantly as vocalizes, but also in short, incomplete phrases. The key signature of the accompanied recitative arioso section is E major. However, this section is quite tonally ambiguous. In fact, it takes 20 measures to finally establish the key. This section also includes the delusion of the fantasy husband, as well as the break from musical form, which we saw earlier in the cadenza. In this cadenza section, we see evidence of disorganized speech as well. Ophelia starts a sentence, but finishes it on a vocalese, and continues on this vocalese for several measures before fully finishing her sentence and thought. Right after this, we see the first evidence of aural hallucinations, this time in text. In the following quote from her accompanied recit, Ophelia asks the chorus why they're whispering behind her back. However, no one in the chorus has sung since before Ophelia's vocal entrance, which she had already responded to earlier. Here, Mandy and I will demonstrate these symptoms in the first section of the mad scene. As a note, we perform this entire mad scene down a half step. Thomas altered Mignon, a mezzo role, so that Christine Nilsson, a high soprano, could perform it, thus showing that he would change roles to better fit singers' voices. <laughs> 
section is the shortest of the three sections of the MAD scene. However, it features several very important symptoms, both from a 21st and 19th century perspective. The first we will look at are the aural hallucinations found in the orchestra. As seen in this figure, the flute, clarinet, and first violins represent Ophélie's mind, while Ophélie's singing represents her outward actions and speech. Throughout the section, the flute, clarinet, and or first violins play a melody as seen. Then, Ophélie tries to sing over it. Eventually, she gives in to her aural hallucinations and takes over the melody from the orchestra. She then tries again to sing on text, only to go back to the orchestra's melody. This section is also where Barbier, Carré, and Thomas first connect her sexuality with her mental illness, as she gives away her flowers, thus symbolically deflowering herself. In addition, we can see evidence of disorganized speech. In this section, Ophélie sings short sentences offering flowers to the villagers. These sentences are often broken up by vocalises and melismatic passages. Additionally, the sentences themselves have pauses in the middle of the phrases, indicating a difficulty getting through full sentences. Here is our performance of the waltz section. Pay attention to Ophélie's attempts to speak, followed by her picking up the orchestra's melody. to the last section of the mad scene, the ballade and coda. This section features several musical and textual forms of symptoms, including exoticism, as discussed earlier, delusions, in this case the wee of the ballad section, and disorganized speech, both in the ballad and coda. In the ballad, the transitional cadenzas and B sections are all on vocalises. In the coda, however, is where we see the most prominent example of disorganized speech. In this section, Ophélie has two to four word phrases splattered throughout melismatic vocalises. Together, these words tell her story, but separately, they don't make much sense and are rather abrupt. Finally, the coda also features some orchestral aural hallucinations. In them, Ophélie mimics what she hears in the orchestra and then takes over the melody. In this figure from the coda, we will see several of these symptoms. First is the high stratospheric singing, representing screaming. Next, we see Thomas' directions to alternate between laughing and crying in rapid succession. Here are some bouts of coloratura. There are, however, longer phrases at other points. In these short phrases of text interspersed throughout the vocalises and melismas, we see the disorganized speech. And finally, we see a brief recurrence of the fantasy husband in delusion, where she calls Hamlet her husband. In this figure from the coda, we can see a few occurrences where the orchestra has a melody or phrase, and Ophelia appears to repeat it soon after it was played. This can be interpreted as aural hallucinations. Here is Mandy's in my performance of the ballad in coda. Please listen for the exotic elements, the uncontrollable laughter and crying, as well as the symptoms of delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized speech found throughout these sections. Oh. 
parts to the suicide theme. The first is a repeat of the ballad melody in E minor, while the second is a return of the melody from Ophélie and Hamlet's Act I duet, Doute de la Lumière, Doubt the Light, which is in E major. The suicide scene is much slower and quieter than the mad scene. However, it's still a continuation of Ophélie's psychosis. In the first part of the suicide scene, like in the first part of the mad scene, Toma begins with tonal ambiguity, showing her fogginess and mental instability. Next, the offstage chorus, representing Ophélie's hallucination of and delusion that she will join the Ouidi, sings Ophélie's ballad melody. At the end, however, circled in sky blue in the figure, Ophélie takes back her ballad melody from the chorus, which fulfills the French grand opera trope of the ballad. What she sang will come to pass. The instruments used in this section represent different aspects of Ophélie's mental illness and death. The flute solo and clarinet in A symbolize her mental instability and psychosis, while the two harps with their flowing, sparkly sound represent the water. In the second part of the suicide scene, the horn in E plays Hamlet's melody from the duet in E major. Ophélie then sings this melody, repeating after the horn in E major, showing that she is imitating him. Similarly to the first part, the harps represent the water in which she will drown. The flute and clarinet represent Ophélie's mind and lingering psychosis. But this time, the most important instrument is the horn in E, which is a hallucination of Hamlet's voice. After Ophélie stops singing and the harp stops playing, the full orchestra join, representing her drowning and death. As I mentioned earlier, the suicide scene has musical and textual evidence of hallucinations and disorganized speech. Regarding the hallucinations, there is both textual and musical evidence. First, a four-part offstage chorus sings her ballad melody. This can be interpreted as a hallucination of the wee-wee drawing her to the water and to her death. Right after this first melody, Ophélie outright says she thinks she hears Hamlet at the beginning of the suicide scene, as seen in the teal-highlighted section of the ballad repeated section in the figure. She first thinks it is Hamlet calling to her, but later directly addresses the wee wee, thus acknowledging that they are the voices she hears. In the second part of the piece, Ophélie hallucinates that she hears Hamlet's voice, which is portrayed by the horn in E. There is also evidence of disorganized speech. The yellow highlighted phrase in the ballad repeat is an unfinished thought. She has a first half of a phrase, but is missing the consequence. In the second section, there are words missing and changed from Hamlet's original text, which are highlighted in yellow as well. This shows disorganized speech again. Mandy and I also performed this piece down a half step. In addition to the orchestral parts, the harp, flute, clarinet, horn, trumpet, etc., Mandy's part also includes a reduction of the four-part offstage chorus, courtesy of Molly Clements. 
was created in the image of the ideal woman and was a documented madness of the 19th century. To form a character appropriate for a 21st century audience, singing actors and directors must construct an historically informed opili. We, as pedagogues, directors, and singing actors, must discuss the difficult topics found in Hamlet, including, but not limited to, mental illness, gaslighting, the objectification of women, and self-harm, with our students and actors to change how women are depicted in opera. The final goals of my project are to increase accessibility and inclusivity of opera, to change how we treat and portray women in opera, and to expand upon this research by looking at other mad characters in the French Grand Opera and Bel Canto repertory. Thank you all so much for attending. As a final parting, here is Jake Heggie's version of Ophelia's final mad scene, which shows a striking comparison between 19th century portrayals of mental illness and late 20th and 21st century depictions. Thank you again. Yeah. Mm -hmm.